It was 1944. Allied bombers had begun pounding the heart of Germany, and beneath the smoke-filled skies, something entirely new had come to life. It wasn't a super tank or a secret rocket. It was a jet engine. The Jumo 004, a sleek, sinister piece of Nazi engineering, became the world's first mass-produced turbojet to power a combat aircraft. But behind its revolutionary speed lay a storm of problems. Fragile materials, a painfully short lifespan, and rushed, desperate design. It had promised to change the war, but failed spectacularly. Today, we peel back the metal skin of history to expose the real story of Germany's jet-powered gamble. Born from desperation, Germany's jet race begins. The story of the Jumo 004 begins not in triumph, but in desperation. By the late 1930s, German engineers knew they had reached the limits of piston engine technology. The Luftwaffe needed faster, higher-flying aircraft to outmatch the growing Allied air forces. Enter jet propulsion, a futuristic concept still in its infancy. While Britain quietly developed Frank Whittle's turbojet, German physicist Hans von Ohain had already captured the Reich's attention. Junkers, one of Germany's leading engine manufacturers, was tasked with transforming theory into firepower. By 1939, early prototypes were being tested in wind tunnels and strapped to aircraft fuselages. The Nazis saw jet power as a potential war-winning leap, and no timeline was too short. The result was a mandate. Build a working jet engine, fast. Junkers answered with the Jumo 004, a streamlined axial flow turbojet designed to be compact, powerful, and ready for combat within just a few years. It was an engineering moonshot launched under totalitarian pressure. But while the basic design was brilliant, it was also dangerously premature. The race to get the Jumo 004 into the air would skip over key reliability testing, trade durability for speed, and lead to consequences that would echo across history. A marvel on paper inside the Jumo 004's radical design. At first glance, the Jumo 004 looked like something from another world. With its cylindrical body, spinning compressor stages, and lack of pistons or propellers, it seemed like science fiction made real. But this wasn't a Hollywood prop. The Jumo 004 was a pioneering axial flow turbojet, a configuration far more efficient than the simpler centrifugal flow engines used by Allied prototypes. It featured an eight-stage axial compressor, an annular combustion chamber, and a single-stage turbine. Together, this layout enabled the engine to produce roughly 1,980 pounds of thrust, a staggering achievement for 1940s technology. The design had major advantages. It was smaller and more aerodynamic than equivalent piston engines, ideal for high-speed flight. But turning blueprints into battlefield machines was another story. Germany lacked the rare heat-resistant alloys needed for sustained turbine operation. As a result, engineers were forced to use steel alloys that couldn't handle high thermal stress, limiting the engine's lifespan to just 10 to 25 hours in the best cases. Even with these compromises, the Jumo 004 set the blueprint for all modern jet engines to follow. It was elegant in theory, but fragile in execution, and that fragility would soon become painfully evident in the heat of battle flames and failures, the hidden costs of innovation. Beneath the roar of the Jumo 004 was a brutal truth. It was a mechanical time bomb. Pilots might have been thrilled by the revolutionary speed it offered, but maintenance crews quickly discovered the cost. The engine's turbine blades warped under heat, bearings seized. Compressor stalls became common mid-flight and the startup procedure itself required a complex ballet of switches, fuel flows, and sometimes even an auxiliary two-stroke engine called the Riedel Starter, an odd miniature piston motor stuffed into the jet's nose cone just to get things spinning. 
The reality? The Jumo 004 was never ready for real combat duty. Its limited lifespan, barely enough for a few missions, meant ground crews were constantly swapping out engines. Worse still, the engine's throttle response was slow and dangerous. Pilots were trained not to push the throttle too quickly, or the sudden change in airflow could cause compressor surges, flameouts, or catastrophic damage. Reports from the Luftwaffe told a grim story. For every engine hour in the air, the Jumo 004 demanded hours of ground maintenance. In some cases, aircraft like the Mi-262 had more downtime than flight time. The future had arrived, but it was coughing smoke, bleeding fuel, and barely holding together. The Mi-262, when the jet took flight. Despite its flaws, the Jumo 004 had one undeniable achievement. It powered the Messerschmitt Mi-262, the world's first operational jet fighter. Sleek, Twin-engined and faster than any Allied aircraft, the Mi-262 could hit speeds of 540 miles per hour, nearly 100 miles per hour faster than the P-51 Mustang. It was a terrifying sight, and for good reason. In the hands of a skilled pilot, the Mi-262 could strike like lightning, then vanish before prop-driven interceptors could react. But the engine remained its Achilles' heel, while the Mi-262 could dominate in short bursts, it was limited by the Jumo's fragility. Engines failed mid-mission. Takeoffs required long runways, and landings were treacherous due to the engine's lagging throttle. Worse, Germany's fuel supplies were dwindling by 1944, and synthetic jet fuel production struggled to keep up. Still, when the Mi-262 worked, it worked brilliantly. Veteran Luftwaffe ace Adolf Galland flew one and famously declared it like being pushed by angels. But that angelic push came at a terrible cost. The Jumo 004's maintenance demands, fuel thirst, and tendency to break down under strain meant that Germany's wonder weapon never achieved the air dominance it promised. It was brilliance chained to a crumbling regime. Shortcuts and Sabotage How Wartime Chaos Undermined the 004 By 1944, Germany's war machine was on life support. Cities were bombed, factories dismantled, and skilled laborers were either dead or drafted. Into this chaos came the Jumo 004, a complex, heat-sensitive jet engine requiring precision materials and craftsmanship. What it got instead was rushed assembly lines, untrained workers, and sometimes outright sabotage. With skilled machinists in short supply, the Nazi regime turned to forced labor. Concentration camp prisoners were brought into engine production facilities like Mittelwerk and underground bunkers near Nordhausen. Conditions were appalling, morale non-existent, and mistakes, intentional or not, were rampant. As a result, engine quality varied wildly. Some units failed after just a few hours. Others were delivered with missing parts, misaligned turbines, or fuel lines that leaked dangerously. Compounding the issue was Hitler's own interference. Obsessed with turning the Mi-262 into a blitz bomber, he delayed mass fighter production, demanding it be outfitted for bombing roles, sacrificing agility and strategic timing. By the time Mi-262s were deployed in meaningful numbers, it was already too late. The Jumo 004's story is not just one of innovation, it's one of desperation, exploitation, and collapse. It stood on the bleeding edge of technology, but was dragged down by the crumbling world around it. The Fuel Fiasco, a jet engine ahead of its infrastructure. Even the most advanced engine is only as good as the fuel it burns, and the Jumo 004 had a serious dependency. Jet fuel, or J2 synthetic kerosene, wasn't widely available in wartime Germany. While piston engines ran on gasoline, the Jumo required specialized fuel blends that Germany struggled to produce at scale. 
Allied bombing raids targeted refineries, crippling the synthetic fuel supply chain. Pilots were often forced to limit training hours or fly with lower quality fuel, which caused incomplete combustion, turbine damage, and engine failures mid-flight. Some Jumo Zero's 4s had to be detuned to avoid damage from impure fuel, sacrificing thrust for survival. Fuel storage was another nightmare. Improper handling led to contamination, engine surges, and shortened lifespan. The lack of a robust refueling and distribution network exposed a brutal irony. Germany had created a revolutionary power plant, but didn't have the infrastructure to keep it running reliably across the battlefield. Prisoners and Pressure – The Human Cost of Jet Production Behind the Jumo 004's sleek engineering was a tragic truth. Its mass production relied heavily on forced labor. As skilled technicians were conscripted into the Wehrmacht, the Nazi regime filled engine factories with prisoners from concentration camps. Underground facilities like Mittelwerk became centers of Jumo assembly, where exhausted, malnourished workers toiled under brutal conditions. Sabotage became both a resistance tactic and a survival mechanism. Loose rivets, misaligned turbine blades, or improperly fastened fuel lines quietly slipped into finished units, many of which failed during testing or combat. Engineers were aware of the quality issues but had no choice but to press forward. Even Junkers admitted in internal reports that production standards were inconsistent. Under Hitler's growing paranoia and desperation, the demand for functional jet engines outpaced what the shattered industrial workforce could deliver. The result was an engine program that sacrificed reliability and humanity alike in its rush to field miracle weapons. Combat performance when the Jumo 004 hit the skies. When the Mi-262 finally reached operational units in 1944, the world's first jet fighter was unlike anything the Allies had seen. Powered by twin Jumo 004 engines, it could easily outrun every piston engine aircraft in the sky. In straight line speed and high altitude strikes, it was untouchable. Bomber formations were shredded in seconds by its 30mm cannons. Veteran pilots like Walter Nowotny and Adolf Galland raved about its capabilities when it worked, and that's where the legend faltered. The Jumo 004 remained alarmingly unreliable in combat. Engines flamed out mid-mission. Throttle response was so slow that rapid maneuvers could destroy the turbine. Landings were notoriously dangerous. Engine failures on final approach were a death sentence. Takeoffs were no better, requiring long runways and careful throttle management to avoid compressor stalls. Allied pilots quickly adapted. They learned to ambush Mi 262s during takeoff or landing when the jets were sitting ducks. Despite Germany's claims, the Mi 262 never turned the tide of the war. There were simply too few, too late, flying on engines that couldn't keep up with the demands of war. The Jumo 004 gave Germany a glimpse into the future, but it arrived broken, overworked, and already on the edge of obsolescence. The Spoils of War – How the Allies Used the Jumo 004 When Germany surrendered, the Allies weren't just after Nazi leaders, they were after their technology. And at the top of that list was the Jumo 004. Captured jet engines, Mi-262 airframes, and technical blueprints were rushed out of Germany by American, British, and Soviet teams. What they found was both awe-inspiring and alarming. Despite its flaws, the Jumo 004 had pioneered a design concept that would become the backbone of post-war jet propulsion. The United States brought dozens of Jumo 004 engines to Wright Field, where engineers studied and disassembled them piece by piece. Lessons from the axial compressor, combustion chamber design, and turbine configuration found their way into early American engines like the General Electric J31 and J35. 
In Britain, Rolls-Royce engineers took cues from the Jumo, but ultimately refined centrifugal flow models. The Soviets wasted no time. They reverse-engineered the Jumo 004 almost directly, producing it as the RD-10, which powered the Yak-15 and other early jets. For years, echoes of the 004's whine could be heard across test fields in Moscow. Ironically, the jet engine that failed to save Nazi Germany became the foundation for the very air forces that would shape the Cold War. It was theft by necessity, and history moved on. A legacy of firsts, what the Jumo 004 left behind. Though its operational record was mixed, the Jumo 004 holds a unique place in aviation history. It was the first jet engine to fight in war. That alone makes it a technological milestone. Its axial flow design became the gold standard, influencing virtually every military and commercial engine that followed. The engine's development forced engineers to rethink everything, from metallurgy to airflow, from cooling methods to maintenance logistics. The brutal lessons of the 004's failures weren't wasted. Engineers learned firsthand the consequences of inadequate materials, rushed production, and poor heat resistance. Those failures drove innovation in turbine blade alloys, modular engine design, and fuel systems. Today's jet engines, safe, reliable, and capable of thousands of flight hours, owe a silent debt to the Jumo 004's painful missteps. The engine also shaped the doctrine of reliability-centered design. No longer was raw thrust enough. Maintainability and longevity became top priorities. A small number of Jumo 04s still exist in museums, their once roaring turbines now cold and silent. But their legacy hums beneath every Airbus, every fighter jet, every space launch booster. The Jumo 004 was both a warning and a beacon, a failed savior of one regime and a spark for a global revolution in flight. The Jumo 004 was more than a machine. It was a paradox. It marked the birth of the jet age, yet died in infancy. It was Germany's boldest aviation breakthrough and also its most flawed. Today, its sound is gone, but its influence echoes in every jet engine soaring through our skies. The story of the Jumo 004 isn't just about war. It's about the price of innovation, the human cost of ambition, and the fine line between brilliance and breakdown. If you're fascinated by these forgotten engines that shaped history, hit like, subscribe, and buckle up. We've got more stories coming your way.